Cindy, I, I hope I pronounced this right, Ordal High, has worked as an advanced level clinician specialist in women's health care for more than 20 years. Um, she specializes in, and this is so very common, you start, start thinking, treatment of pelvic and vulvar pain. A lot of people have pain during sex. She works with very young gynecologic patients and also women recovering from sexual violence. I am, by training, an eye physician and surgeon, and it was one time in my practice I swore that 50% of the population had been sexually abused. It's so prevalent out there, so somebody who works with people who've dealt with been in sexual violence is very important. She works at the Scripps Clinic, and also in collaboration with John Willems, Chairman of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Okay, Cindy, give us some idea about Staying healthy during perimenopause and menopause. What are some of the things that we can do to stay healthy? Well, I think, um, is this on? Yes. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, in the, in the film, the obvious connection between diet and exercise. And I think what also is a huge component is um, a healthy attitude and, and having a good support system around you. Um, many women find that they get symptomatic with um, hot flashes, sleeplessness, uh, loss of word finding ability, and these are all things that are early signs of, of hormone uh, changes, and they're relatively easy to treat. And so, um, I have many patients who tell me that they think they're just getting older and. Um, it's something that they have to put up with, and uh, I'm here to tell you that it's not the case, and many things can be done, uh, particularly in the sexual sphere as well. For women who are losing sexual interest, that's a huge part of being a well, happy person, and if that's been an important part of your life in the past, you don't have to say goodbye to that. Wonderful, and I'll tell you my personal cure for that interest thing is get myself a boy toy. <laughs> the boy toy works really well. But on that note, I'm going to introduce the illustrious Dr. Erwin Goldstein. World renowned sexual medicine physician. This is the pioneer, the founder of it all. We have him in this room. And he's the co author of When Sex Hurts. And when sex is in the good, the director of sexual medicine of Alvarado Hospital. Um, he has so many accolades here. Gold medal for the World Association for Sexual Health. Um, for his lifetime contributions to the field, has been all over the place, CNN, Oprah, all these other people that you want to talk about, rights for WebMD, Dr. Goldstein. Now, I just want to sit and talk to you for the whole make hour. The question simple. <laughs> <laughs> make, make my question simple. See, people get on my show and they're like, how did she ask those hard questions of me? But, okay, let's just, we, we saw the movie here, but first, can you start by giving us a good definition of perimenopause, menopause? We're talking here that it's starting before we even know it's starting and they're saying this is happening at 35. First, a good definition and when we're talking about using hormone therapy or something like that, should women be starting this type of thing in their 30s? And what happens when you get people like me to walk in and say, I don't want to talk about menopause, I want to talk about having another child. So talk about hormones, definitions, impart some knowledge on us. <laughs> God bless you. First of all, thank you everyone for being here, honestly. And this is a great panel and I, I, we're going to have a lot of fun today. Uh, perimenopause, uh, I guess, would start uh, when hormones start falling, which typically is age 40-ish uh, and goes progressively on. If you look at testosterone in women, it starts to falling sadly at age 30. Uh, men, it starts to fall at age 40. Um, uh, estrogen ceases abruptly at age 51, but you can see the changes in the ovarian synthesis of estrogens falling. You can also see when the uh, ovulation stops, progesterone falls. So there's a lot of hormonal changes starting at age 40 and it's important to be aware of them and be knowledgeable about them and to seek help. Uh, one of the sort of 
themes of the panel is not to sort of say, throw your hands up in the air and commit suicide and say, I can't do this, is to read, be empowered, and to get information and to find help from people who are willing to work with you. Uh, I don't know what else I could say, but that sounds good. Should, should people be starting hormones earlier? Well, you're asking me, I'm really passionate about hormones, and I really think hormones should be started uh, when they're appropriately needed, and uh, uh, I wouldn't wait to WHI age 75 and give hormones. That's a little long to wait, um, but I think appropriate discussions with healthcare providers uh, I, I think are rational and uh, are really preventative when started earlier. One thing I want to ask you is, you talk about appropriate discussion with the right health care providers. One thing that has been very difficult is finding the right health care providers. Give us some strategies on targeting people who are going to help get the answers that we want. Okay. Um, North American Menopause Society has a list of practitioners that are certified in menopause. And that should be available to anyone who wants to go on the website. Um, I've been certified by them, and um, it's an, actually a specialty in menopause treatment. Um, so North NAMS, that's one place to go um, for a list of people that are that have been specifically trained. I would say something as well. I agree with that, being an NAMS certified practitioner as well. It's menopause.org is where you can actually find that information. But I think the other important thing is, you know, if, and this is highlighted in the movie as well, if you're not feeling like you're getting the right information from your doctor, if they're just somewhat dismissive or not informed enough, um, one woman pointed out she just felt like her doctor was very hands-off and just kind of left the decisions up to her and she really didn't know how to make that. Um, decision about using hormones, then I think that's probably the indication to find somebody else. Um, but definitely using the NAMS site um, would be a good start in terms of finding a menopause specialist. Can I just address what you asked earlier about perimenopause, when do you start? Um, there's tremendous variety from one woman to another in terms of what her clock is doing. And what, um, you know, one often reads, well, you should get your hormones tested. Um, in somebody who's perimenopausal, who you know maybe in their in their mid thirties and suspects that they're having some hormonal changes, a very efficient test is to look at day three follicle stimulating hormone, and there's another test called anti mullerian hormone um, that will that are usually used for fertility patients, but give us a very good idea of whether the ovary is struggling or not, and those are little clues that. Can be you know can be gathered that are real um, and and measurable um, in helping decide to helping someone decide. We also take into account people's menstrual cycles, changes in menstrual cycles that are uh, may uh, show apparent um, uh, you know changes in hormone production. I, 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 was say, I was going to say one more thing, I was just thinking related to the perimenopause that starting early, your other question starting early in the 30s, there's still a risk of pregnancy for a lot of these women. Um, they're still cycling, they're still maybe not ovulating monthly, but you know, periodically they may be ovulating if they're starting irregular cycles in their late 30s, early 40s. So that's something we just have to kind of consider if we're just going to use hormone therapy as, as replacement for those women that it may not be appropriate if they still need contraception. So. Um, something that kind of comes into the discussion in the women who are still having periods. The ovary quits making progesterone before it quits making estrogen, so oftentimes changes in cycle um, length are very good indicators that progesterone is, is falling off. And um, the, what I would emphasize in this is that in a perimenopausal woman or a young woman, um, this has to be very highly individualized to her circumstance. There's no cookie cutter for everybody. Sure. Questions from the audience? Questions? <laughs> Sir? Thank you. Uh, is there an increased risk of, of breast cancer for women who have a family history of breast cancer? Does that make it um, worse, if you will? We told the you take hormones. Well, yeah, I, mean, I, would, I would say um, having a first degree relative with breast cancer is considered a risk factor. Um, the majority of breast cancers are sporadic, however, um, but about 10% are going to be familial related to possibly hereditary mutation. But um, still, yes, a first degree relative or a strong 
family history of, even on the paternal side, maternal side, second, multiple secondary relatives would be considered a risk factor, so yes. There are um, um, uh, questionnaires online that can be used in the clinical setting to calculate one's five-year risk and lifetime risk for breast cancer. And there are a number of these um, that can be used and, and one can sit down and actually calculate really Las Vegas odds for the statistical risk of getting breast cancer in the next five years. Sometimes that's very helpful for people who are trying to make a decision. You know, if it looks like you're in a very high risk category, gee, you may want to think about something else. I mean, the BRCA mutation, BRCA, um, is BRCA1 and 2 is a mutation that's been identified to increase the risk of um, breast and ovarian cancer. So, you know, a sort of a concern would be somebody who has a history of premenopausal breast cancer, um, uh, multiple family members, especially with a history of premenopausal mother, sister with breast, a patient themselves who has breast and ovarian cancer. Um, so those are some things we look for in terms of, um, or a history. Right, or Ashkenazi Jewish um, ethnicity, um, or a history of male breast cancer in the family. Actually, a, a male relative with breast cancer is a high risk. So um, those patients I refer for genetic counseling um, to consider possibly um, being tested for the BRCA1 or 2 mutation. Um, unfortunately, I see, I see a lot of those patients actually after they've had risk-reducing surgery, say having mastectomy or oophorectomy going through an abrupt surgical menopause um, at a young age, usually in their early 40s, and those are probably my most challenging patients to, to help. Um, yeah. I have a question about um, when they check your hormones and they say, oh, well, they're just fine and dandy, you're still having your period and all this great stuff, and it so happens that you're noticing some subtle changes and you say, well, you know what, I beg to differ, but then a naturopath will say, well, yeah, you've got some problems, and your medical doctor says, mm, no, you've still got the same hormones, it's all good and fine. Why is there such a differential? And with also thyroid hormones, I diagnosed my own thyroid disease, which was pretty pathetic. But from one year to the next, I knew exactly when I had a problem. And I thought, well, I've been thrown into menopause because all the symptoms were like identical, paralleling. And I'm thinking, oh well, gosh, what's going on? And sure enough, my thyroid was Graves' disease, and then they did RAI, and then it went to hypo. So I've had eye surgeries, six of them, to correct the thyroid eye disease. So it's interesting because I've seen all this stuff in the past three years, and I'm thinking and baffled and hearing all of this and saying, well, there's a lot of good information, but why is it that different doctors differ so much? What is the problem? Why can't we get a good answer? Well, I guess I would say that um, one has to look at the whole picture in speaking with somebody about their symptoms. Mm -hmm. And the blood you don't treat the blood trust, you treat the patient. Right. And hormone levels vary from day to day in a normal cycle. And someone whose ovaries are stopping and starting, on any given day they may look fine, on another day they may not look so fine. Right. So, you know, if you're in a specific age range and you're over 45, we know what's going on with your ovary. There's no question. It doesn't matter, right. per se, what the test shows. Yeah, oh, I just turned 50 and, this year, so yeah. that's why I know. And, you know, if they're waiting for a test to show you, you know, by the time that you actually make zero estrogen, People who typically have had symptoms for years, mm -hmm. so um, you know it's not it's not the right way to diagnose it. I think that's a great question, and um, uh, I would love you to take this question to UCSD Medical School. I'd like you to take it to UCLA Medical School. The fact is, sex steroid hormone medicine is really not taught. It's not even taken on by the endocrinology world. It's it's taken on by a few gynecologists and a few sexual medicine doctors and few nurse practitioners who are you know, interested in this area, it, there's so much controversy and it really has to focus on people interested in this to sort of dissect through. Some people use saliva to measure the results, some people use blood. There's no real relation of saliva to blood. Uh, blood testing in and of itself, even though it's thought to be better, there are tests somehow better than others. 
we haven't really found the correct test for everything. So I think you got to wade through the muck and find people who are going to work with you. And it may end up being your naturopath. Who knows? I don't know. Uh, um, but, but the bottom line is find someone who, who wants to work with you and is willing to care for you in your own individual way. Well, it's like you find that you have to be your own advocate and say, hey, there's something wrong. I know it. Please show me. Hi, um, 51 years old and um, uh, four years out from my last period, was going through menopause in my mid-40s, um, had a couple breast biopsies in like 45, 46, which were negative. So um, when the period stopped at age 47, I opted not to do hormones because I was afraid. Um, I now have osteopenia in both of my hips and in my lower spine and I've been on Actinil for a year. Um, I haven't had the next bone density test to see where I am, but um, I've had this nagging feeling like I should be doing something more, and I feel myself getting older. I have an eight-year-old an eight daughter, and my question is, if I'm four years post-menopause and I'm dealing with some osteopenia issues, is it too late to start any kind of hormone therapy? Because I'm sitting here, and I start crying. I'm like, I I gotta have this. I need something. I mean, I made it through all the hot flashes and all the insomnia. I did that for years, and I'm done with that now. But I'm afraid for my health. Before we answer that, what, what did you think of the movie? Because the movie is for you. This we dedicated this I was this bawling whole event with my husband. You. At the end, I was I was crying and I was like scared. And I was I was like I said to him, I said I want that. I want it now. I'm afraid. I don't want to. I don't want to. I, I don't want to fall and break a hip or you know anything like that. When I have, you know, I had my child at 42, and I'm a very young, active, 51-year-old with a with a young daughter, and um, I uh, I feel like I'm not having the support in my body that I probably need. And again. My primary care physician is, you know, it's up to you, but you know, you had the breast biopsies, but they were negative. I never had anything. Um, so, yeah, just fear. I, I would say, first of all, to just, you know, I, I don't really treat osteopenia with bisphosphonate drugs. They're kind of powerful and they're really designed to prevent fracture in women with osteoporosis. So, there's a better way to figure out your fracture risk based on your age. It's probably a lot lower, even though you have osteopenia. There's a calculator that your physician can use. One side is closer own. to osteoporosis, I was told. What? It's close to osteoporosis. One side is, yeah. What? Okay. You know, even with your age, though, other factors, it looks at other risk factors, it'll calculate your 10 year risk of having a, a fracture, a, a hip fracture or a major osteoporotic fracture. And I tend to see in my younger patients, like your age, that that risk is just not really that high. And I, so I don't treat that much osteopenia anymore. Um, at least not not with bisphosphonates. Um, the estrogen issue, though, you know, is is relevant. Um, the North American Menopause Society is extremely conservative on their stance now. So certainly, their position would be: you don't have any hot flashes, night sweats. You're past that point, so you don't need hormones. But um, certainly, there would still be a benefit of using estrogen for your bones and possibly for other issues you're having. So. I, I just. I just like to add to that, and one of the things that may be helpful for you to think about is that within the pantheon of things that are available for hormone replacement therapy, there are things that we have data um, that, that actually tells us that these specific areas are somewhat safer. For example, um, using transdermal therapy will give you a lower dose and it also pretty much eliminates the risk of blood clotting and it, risk, it, it eliminates the risk of gallbladder disease because it, it's not going through your liver, it's going right into your bloodstream. And um, for someone who's no longer having hot flashes, a very tiny dose of estrogen would be very helpful for your bones. You know, we're talking about even something as low as 0 0.025. In the WHI study women, we're taking 0.625. So this is, you know, um, even a small amount would make a big difference, and it also might make a difference very much in how you feel as well.
Can I ask you about your sex life? Is that allowed? <laughs> Well, I would definitely hear. I have my own things on that. Well, I mean, I told him, I said, it's like out the window. Yeah, I mean, all the symptoms. Well, estrogen is playing a big role in that, and um, blood vessels shrink in the absence of estrogen. And just like men need engorgement of the blood vessels in the pelvic region to have an erection and sexual and a good sexual response, so do women. And those blood vessels turn into little thread-like things in the absence of estrogen. So even estrogenizing the vagina would make a huge difference, and probably testosterone. Question over here. Um, it's, thank it's, you for your it's not so much a question, but I just want to say thank you for an incredible movie. I learned more tonight than I've probably learned in my whole entire life. I want to make a statement which is absolutely contrary to everything that we're hearing here. I am a genetically disabled uh, person. I have the H.E.R to neuron, which predisposes my cells to proliferation, which has resulted in, at the age of 19, a dermoid cyst, which is one cyst that encapsulates the, gen the gonads and goes cancerous. So that's 19. In April, I came out with three separate cancers this year. I was under, I have a wonderful, wonderful primary care physi physician who's worked with me all these years. And I was on hormonal replacement therapy. Well, now, uh, I really love the movie for what it says about find your way. I am a freak. I've never gone through menopause, never had a hot flash never missed a period, never. In my 60s, I'm in my 70s now, in my 60s, my doctor noticed that, you know how you go in and he says, when was your last period? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I said, March 21st. <laughs> March 21st? Yeah. You're in your 60s. I said, uh, yeah. Uh, so he said, you must have endometrial cancer. You must have it. We're going to investigate endometrial cancer. So I went and I went and they said, well, your uterus is really strange. It's so <laughs> luscious. <laughs> <laughs> so they said, we've got to take it out. <laughs> now remember, I've got one ovaries gone when I got pregnant with my dermoid cyst and my cancer at that time. That's 19. Now I'm in my 60s, or, yeah, whatever. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, I'll let go of my, my nice, you know, you know yeah. And so I go over it, and they do a hysterectomy, and they ship it over to UCI. And they keep it for four months, and they're chopping it up, and they're looking at it, and they're doing all their things. <laughs> You know what they said? This uterus is too young for this body. Well, well, see what the truth of the matter is, is that my cells, because of the HER2 neuron, they want to blow up, blow up, blow up. And so what's happened now is that I will probably, and like I said, I'm a surgical hysterectomy. I will be dealing with um, cancers. Yeah, the big C. I will be dealing. And by the way, I have four daughters. The two eldest have the same problem. It's a genetic issue. Now, what's the benefit? The benefit is knowing by the pathological, here's all my tests and evaluations. The truth of the matter is, my doctor and I are now consulting 
about putting me back on hormone replacement. And the reason is, is that my cancers are not stimulated by them. We don't react to them. And I like lubricating. <laughs> and I have an 81 year old boyfriend. <laughs> so I'm going to work on it because my body, well, you may not want my body, but this body I have investigated in detail. I exercise it, I feed it, I'm a recovering alcoholic. Yeah. I'm 40 years sober, and I'm having a great life, and I think I'm going back on hormone replacement. I'm selling a t-shirt that says, I like lubrication. <laughs> like to add to this conversation is why do we not teach this in school why do we not teach this in school I mean this is something like get the better food in school get some information in school how do you answer that it's just not part of the curriculum where it should be I don't... we're trying we've got some gentlemen that want to ask some questions thank you uh, hello. First of all, thank you all so very, very, very much. The movie is wonderful. It's 50 years too late for some people, like me. I'd like to discuss testing for hormone, hormone situation, such as testosterone, because I was told there's no way to determine in women how much is enough or not enough. And that's a big issue. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> uh, testosterone is a na as natural to a woman as is estrogen. We have done studies in women who do not have sexual problems, and we can record the blood and send it to an NIH laboratory and identify what ranges are in those women, and we can try and identify what your range is and try and get it to the range that is higher, consistent with those women who do not have sexual problems. There's lots of FDA approved biologically identical statuses for women, excuse me, for men. This Biosante concept may actually be the first testosterone for women. Uh, but um, uh, we have many thousands of women on testosterone and there's no reason why you can't be on it as well. Well, you're for... Sure. You are four educated professionals. You're among the few that understand that subject. Well, I think everybody here. <laughs> what, what I'd also like to mention to you is that there are, men make 10 to 12 times more testosterone than women. Most of the lab tests that are offered through regular laboratories have been, have been calibrated to test men and they're not accurate for women. So it, they, the blood tests for women have to be sent to a specific laboratory to get a really accurate result. Not everyone apparently is aware of that because they just tell me there's no accurate test for women, period. They're, they're wrong. Yeah. I would agree with that. That's I'm not correct. There is, you can certainly You're have female yeah. testosterone assays performed. Um, but the issue is again talking about levels that everyone's an individual. So. Um, I personally don't really treat numbers um, unless they're excessively high and I'm worried about, you know, some really abnormal elevation in the level. But um, it's really how women feel and um, what, you know, what, how, how they respond to the therapy. Since we know that, that testosterone drops so precipitously, you know, for someone in a specific age range, we can pretty much safely assume that it's extremely low. And starting with a low dose testosterone would be a very simple trial of therapy. Well, I don't yield easily, and I'm one of the persons that was on hormone replacement therapy prior to menopause. I'm still on it. I discussed it with my physician because I was part of the WHI control study. So I think I've had 
hormone replacement for something like 30 years, and I never intend to stop just like that lady. Okay, I have a question from a gentleman over here. I, w I wouldn't say gentleman. <laughs> Actually, one comment I want to make is that I know it said in, in some sort of fun during the movie, but I'm struck that I hope everybody leaves with the fact that if this was happening to the man, something would have been done about it already, so you need to take some political action regarding it. Um, the other comment, or the other question I would have is that there seems to be a lot of ambiguity about what works and what doesn't work, and i got to feel that there's got to be some uh, political reason, some sort of FDA, some sort of influence that's happened in Washington and drug pharmaceutical companies that don't want certain things to happen, that's got to be involved in that and, uh, and that's probably why it's not educated in schools and will never get there until we change that. I, I just, thank you very much, but I just want everybody to know that first of all, that the National Osteoporosis Foundation is participating with us as well as the Society for Women's Health Research, which does research on women for women, and is our watchdog in Washington. So be aware of those groups, because they're out there trying to help you guys.